Well, hello and welcome to the uh, webinar by International District Energy Association. My name is Rob Thornton. I'm the president and CEO of IDEA. I'll be serving as moderator for, uh, for today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, just uh, some logistics and a, and a bit of housekeeping. Kristen, next slide, please. So uh, webinar has obviously commenced at three o'clock. We'd ask if you would please uh, submit questions uh, in the Q&A box. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen, sort of in the, in the center, Q&A. So please you know, sub submit questions as we go. Uh, we're gonna have presentations by each of the award winners, and then we'll allow some time at the conclusion uh, for question and answers. If any of you are having any difficulties with audio or video, uh, please uh, reach out to Kristen Hawkins, on the chat and, uh, and she'll be able to, uh, hopefully to assist you. Again, for housekeeping purposes, the webinar is going to be recorded and at the conclusion or soon after, once, uh, once Zoom uh, does its work, we'll share with all of you a link to the streaming uh, uh, content as well as uh, we'll also send a link to the slides themselves and they'll be available in PDF format at our website, www.districtenergy.org. Um, so again, please uh, submit your questions as you go, and I'm sure we'll have time to handle those. I'd like to thank, uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank our sustaining sponsors for their ongoing support. They include Clearway Energy. Uh, Kristen, do you mind backing up just a second uh, to our sustaining sponsors? Clearway Energy, NG, Johnson Controls, Solar Turbines, thermo systems and train. And uh, if anyone on the call is curious or, or interested in exploring what it means to be a sustaining sponsor of IDA, please reach out to us at IDA at districtenergy.org. Uh, we'll have more information at the conclusion. So here's the agenda for today. I'm gonna give a, just a quick overview of what is district energy space and how has this, uh, how has this report evolved over the past 20 years? What, 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 should be, what should be our takeaways from 2019? Uh, the awards are presented in 2020, but it's really based on last year's experience. And then we'll hear from our award winners. They include Clearway Energy from Pittsburgh, vicinity from two locations, Boston and Philadelphia. And then our friends from Ottawa, uh, the Energy Services Acquisition Program. And just to clarify, today we're only doing the North American award winners we're gonna, we'll be uh, doing a similar webinar for the segment of district energy space beyond North America, uh, really given the difference in time zone in most of those participants are in the Middle East and Asia. We'll be doing that uh, with it very soon and we're coordinating it, uh, but we'll be getting, uh, doing it you know, quite early in the morning uh, in, uh, in Boston time so that it's acceptable to our friends that are nine or 12 hours ahead of us um, so if you if you don't mind if you're joining the call if you would please uh, 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 mute yourself mute your phone or mute your your site and then please if you would uh, submit questions in the q a box uh, not the chat thank you so district energy space every year since the year 2000 IDA members uh, submit to us, uh, the, the number of new, of new building or new customer buildings. And these can be existing buildings or um, are obviously new construction. Or in addition, uh, some years ago, we determined that contract extensions should also be included. Not unlike what happens with real estate reports regarding the central business district of cities. When a, when a large tenant renews a lease for 10 years, that's also counted uh, you know, in that community. Um, so we, we didn't wanna, uh, because in fact, if you think about it, a, a customer that extends for another uh, 10 year period is actually making a decision to stay with district energy and not depart. Uh, so you know, we think it's appropriate to include those numbers. Um, but in addition to the number of buildings and their size, we ask uh, our participants to share the gross square feet, the size of the building. We also uh, um, uh, segment by customer building type or use. So commercial office, residential, hotel, 
Uh, and then the end use in the building, is it space heating, domestic hot water, uh, space cooling? And in this report, year to date, since we began, over two and a half billion square feet of customers have been added to district energy systems. Um, next slide, Kristen. Now, I, 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 do want to, I do want to share that this is a voluntary uh, you know, submittal. It's not required. Uh, and I think it's frankly a little bit like voting in the United States. We don't have a 100% participation. Um, but we think it's important to, to demonstrate the year over year growth, the system growth, uh, to actually help our members understand what customer uh, use segments are coming online and where are they? And what type, is it a new construction? Obviously there's advantages if you're designing a building to design around district energy, but a large portion of uh, new customers are existing buildings that are converting or retrofitting to district energy. So this is really a tool intended to help our members uh, reinforce customer confidence. If you're the business development professional in a city, uh, and let's say you're, you're negotiating or talking with the new hotel that's uh, in design or construction or zoning, it's useful to go to them and say, hey, by the way, did you know that last year, 15 hotels join district energy systems in the United States. So it, it, it's intended to give um, you know, some market density, market confidence to our members, but to reinforce that, but because let's all acknowledge customers are essential to our accept, success. Whether you're a downtown district energy system, a campus or airport, uh, really customers are what are what are the reason we are here. And then finally, with DE Space, you know, we do have some friendly competition among our member systems and peer recognition. And that, that's part of what we're going to do today is uh, recognize our award winners from a, a bronze, silver, and gold uh, perspective. So first, third, second, and first uh, in the respective segments. So what, what's driving this growth? The next slide, Kristen. What, why is district energy growing? Well, obviously, you know, I may be preaching to the choir, but energy efficiency, you know, enhancing reliability, customer buildings are able to, you know, more efficiently allocate capital. Uh, they can recover space in the building that's otherwise earmarked for mechanical uh, or electrical uh, equipment. In particular, roof space becomes available. Uh, you know, to an end user, and that can generate significant real estate value. And, and one of the real obvious advantages and, and the reasons why people connect to district cooling is district cooling really removes and reduces peak electric demand. If, if the alternative are, let's say, electric chillers, uh, district cooling can dramatically flatten the, the demand profile and help that customer avoid consuming the most expensive electricity when it's high demand and high cost. And many of our members uh, user and users report the convenience, the ease of use of district energy. And we've seen this over the, the period of the pandemic, not having equipment to start and stop and monitor and manage and repair really does make our customer buildings much more uh, convenient and easier to use. And finally, this driver is emerging, the environmental advantages. By connecting to a highly efficient district energy system, uh, our customers reduce their carbon emissions and water use. And, and really we see the environmental advantages uh, in increasing in value uh, in the marketplace. So what's, let's take a little broader view. Uh, looking out at North America and beyond North America, here's a graph. And again, all of these graphs will be available uh, and, and we'll send the links so you can use them in your own presentations, in your own purposes. But in, in 2019, in North America, over 72 million square feet was reported, 334 buildings. Again, I, I, I want to clarify, reported. Uh, you know, we actually, we think the, the actual number is, is, is higher. Um, and that compares to in 2018, 
174 buildings are 62 million square feet in North America. When we, when we, uh, when we track this information beyond North America, uh, this year over 108 million square feet in 303 buildings were, uh, were connected or reported. And that compares to last year, 159 and just under 50 million square feet. So it, you know, 2019 looks like it's, you know, almost double, uh, not in square feet in North America, but significantly uh, increase. So if, you, if we look at our next slide, um, the, uh, so again, globally, let, let me paraphrase, globally since uh, 2000, in North America were over 930 million square feet added beyond North America, almost 1.6 billion square feet. So in North America, we're averaging right around 56 million square feet of new customer each year. And beyond North America, you know, slightly larger, 73 million square feet per year. And that's based on a, an average over the last five years. Next slide. Uh, so here's the breakdown. I won't get into this too much. It's in the report and you can look at it. But uh, in terms of the, the total square footage by, cat, by uh, segment, North America or beyond, you can see last year uh, com commercial mixed use, government, hotel, residential. This is notable in uh, beyond North America, the residential reported last year was nearly 40 million square feet, 39 million square feet. And here in North America, just over 6 million. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the markets are, are, are somewhat different too. But if you, when you look at the report, uh, we also, not only do we identify each building, of the square footage of each building, uh, but also, uh, you know, the use and the category. Um, and so I, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I won't again draw, drill down too far. Let's just go to the next slide. So, you know, we think it's important to characterize our customer use in North America. You know, the majority, significant majority, is commercial office space, fifty-seven percent. Um, but you know, there are uh, uh, sport, uh, cultural entertainment. So this would be, you know, arenas, stadiums. Uh, government is an important segment, hotels, uh, residential, and then schools and hospitals make up 15%. Uh, and I, what I meant to say is that we, in, in addition to the numbers, you'll see in district energy space in the report, uh, photographs or images of many of the customers so that, you know, again, you can use it in your market to educate your customers. So let's just, over the past two decades, next slide, you know, I think, I think this is an important graph and it shows you, I think, a valuable trend. So, you know, you look at the, the pace, the growth, uh, you know, is really trending in a good, you know, in a, in a strong direction. Now, I'm not going to, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, guess what will occur uh, post pandemic, et cetera. You know, obviously the economy has slowed. But for the time being, I think you know uh, this is an important graph to show and the breakdown of each. So that's an overview. Again, I'd urge all of you to uh, download the report, share it with your customers, share it with your shareholders, share it with your community. It it should, I think, the intent is to is to help you demonstrate that you're part of a larger global and growing industry. That's really the intent of District Energy Space you know, to, to give confidence to, uh, you know, those, you know, your colleagues in your, uh, in your market and in your hometown. So now let's, let's, uh, let's recognize our, our winners. Again, we, we present these awards in two categories, number of buildings, and then total square feet. And as I mentioned, bronze, silver, and gold. Well, why two categories? Well, if, if we only did, if we only recognized based on square footage, uh, then, you know, it remains, it, it, it follows that larger cities have larger buildings. And, and we wanted to allow for the marketplace uh, to recognize, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say smaller or second tier cities, um, 
but you know cities uh, that really have significant district energy systems but may uh, and and have strong market share so uh, for district energy space it's my pleasure to to present our first bronze award uh, to Clearway you can uh, advance uh, Kristen uh, to Clearway Energy of Pittsburgh for the number of buildings uh, committed uh, they uh, they secured 46 buildings uh, in uh, in 2019 and Samir Kreshi and Ali Kavar are here to share with you some information gentlemen yes uh, thank you very much um, uh, my name is Ali Carver I am the Clearway Energy Regional General Manager for Eastern uh, United States and I'm uh, located in Pittsburgh, PA. I want to show you the reward we got. We are extremely proud of this. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and this was uh, because of the acquisition we did at the Duquesne University uh, in 2019. So um, I pass it to Samir to give a little bit more detail about the uh, the acquisition. Samir. Thanks, Ali. And uh, yeah, I want to echo uh, Ali's comments. Uh, thank you to the IDA for presenting us this award. My name is Samir Qureshi. I'm based out of New York City. Uh, I also support Ali and the balance of our team in terms of uh, growth of, of our business. And uh, maybe before I talk about the transaction, you know, we can talk about kind of how it occurred really came out of the uh, the vision that Jim Lodge had relative to bringing the Duquesne University energy assets in a core market for us uh, in Pittsburgh into district energy configuration. And I was only one of many team members that executed on, on really a vision that he had relative to his growth of, of this asset and how it could serve the wider Pittsburgh community and, and, and the city. So um, next slide. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna take a few minutes. I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, the, an overview of the transaction that we did. Uh, I'm a more of a financial guy than a technical one. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the financial aspects uh, of this transaction. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the development experience uh, that we have in the marketplace and how we're, are, we're looking to grow and how we're positioned to grow. So from an overview standpoint, we acquired the Duquesne University CHP plant in the summer of 2019. Uh, the transaction provided economic value to Duquesne and it's really expanded our uh, footprint in what is one of our core cities for, for growth. Uh, we're improving the system uh, efficiency today and uh, since working to interconnect it with a neighboring plant that we had built at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, again, uh, led by Jim. And the idea really is to obviously have, uh, you've got two plants that both had an N plus one capacity. We're interconnecting them today and that work is essentially done now. Uh, Ali's been overseeing it and the N one plus capacity gets released and you can kind of monetize that and, and sell that into the market. and uh, Next slide. And so it's, as I talk about kind of taking that excess capacity and selling that into the market, I mean, certainly that was our vision, but you really needed a partner on the other side that, that shared your vision. And that we were lucky in that regard with Duquesne. Duquesne really viewed their assets on campus and their ability to support the neighborhood with district energy, something that would be unique to them. Um, but through a partnership with us, and this transaction was undertaken in a bilateral uh, negotiated manner because they understood our presence. They understood that the technical aspects of being interconnected to a neighboring system would give, provide them additional value uh, in terms of ex excess capacity. They would get freed up additional resiliency and, and efficiencies too. So we were very uniquely positioned to be able to execute on this transaction. And again, the the vision in terms of painting that picture was really something that Jim did working alongside the CFO of, of the university. So we purchased these assets for $102 million, uh, that, the payment that we made to Duquesne. Um, it is kind of the style of a monetization transaction. And this was the first, it was the second transaction in the United States of this style. It, there was only one deal ahead of that at that time, which was Ohio State. And they're, they're very different in, in certain regards. One was uh, at Ohio State, you had a monetization without a true sale of the system, meaning the system really does build, still uh, revert back to the university. Here, the university says, no, we wanted to completely sell and get out of the energy business. Um, this deal was uh, also uh, to date is the only deal. And there's been two other deals that have taken place uh, of this style in the market today, one at Iowa and another one at uh, Idaho. Uh, that's shortly going to be announced. Uh, this is still the only deal in the marketplace that was structured as off balance sheet. 
which did bring additional value to the university. If you think about getting $102 million and not having it show up as debt on your balance sheet, that was additional value. Uh, and we're very proud of the fact that to date, we are the only company that's been able to achieve that, that remains kind of elusive for others to, to be able to replicate. Uh, Duquesne took that upfront payment and put that money in their endowment. They really beefed up what was that that point, you know, $250 million endowment up to $350 million. And as you can imagine, with universities grappling in this uh, COVID atmosphere, I mean, they really showed up their balance sheet. And we're really executing on, on a long-term vision of growth of higher education-focused work versus worrying about energy, which is certainly our focus. So since then, they've announced uh, things like divesting uh, uh, you know, radio assets that they've had, a new medical school that they're doing. And this, uh, the monetization of this asset was certainly a prerequisite for them to continue to focus on their core activities. But they, they were mindful to make sure that they had a partner that was really uh, focused in, as a community, uh, in the community to be able to also provide community energy in, in district energy configuration. Next slide. So I mean, and t undertaking a transaction of this style, obviously, you need to make sure that the operation and maintenance of your assets is going to be uh, top notch. And they certainly had the benefit of Clearway's profile in the neighborhood and being able to talk to people next door, certain like University of Pittsburgh. The financial value that comes out of uh, outsourcing these non-core assets is quite significant. Uh, if you think, think about the cost of our money and how cheap we were able to do this transaction for them and what they are earning in their endowment and creating what's called arbitrage, it's providing them significant value. Uh, interconnection, again, has technical values that, that get released. And uh, although uh, I'm talking a lot about the financial aspects of this transaction, we do lead with the technical aspects of what a good technical partner can bring to the table, layered on with financial and really the layering on of those various components is what really needs to, leads to a win-win for both situations, which, which was the case. In, in this deal, Duquesne was extremely happy at the time that the deal closed with the execution of it, and they continue to uh, be happy with uh, Ali in Pittsburgh today. So, uh, last slide. Next slide. Thank you. And so, uh, just wanted to hit a little bit about the fact that uh, Clareway uh, is a large energy company in the United States. We have the 10th largest portfolio of wind assets in the U.S., close to fifth largest in solar. We have large assets on the grid supplying power, and we do have uh, significant uh, you know, the top three district energy business in, in the country as well. And uh, deals of this style are, are one of three uh, uh, prongs, or one of three stools legs of the stool, I should say, in terms of our strategy for growth, the other two being local growth uh, that Ali is leading, and then essentially greenfield development from the ground up. And we look forward to kind of continue to do these transactions of this style. We are, our majority stockholder is the second largest infrastructure fund in the world, so we can kind of cut large checks and, and do big deals, but we want to do them in a manner that really truly provide technical value along with financial value to, to a partner. So with that, Thanks again, Rob, and thank you to IDEA for the award. Thank you, Samir, and congratulations to you and Ali and your team. Um, you know, for those of you who thank were you, with us at the IDEA annual conference last year in, in 2019, Clearway Energy was our host in Pittsburgh. Uh, they really rolled out the red carpet. And, uh, and in fact, uh, one of the tours was of the Duquesne uh, district energy facility and the and the you know I think the the, the partnership the, the project was announced at that time so uh, you know really congratulations to to everyone uh, affiliated with it and we'll come back to Ali and, and Samir uh, with some questions at conclusion but uh, congratulations gentlemen and thank you thank you very much thank you very good so uh, please uh, uh, please stay stay with us. Uh, our next award, uh, bronze award, uh, is, goes to our, uh, our next winner, uh, really from my hometown in Boston, uh, Vicinity Energy Boston, and we're really pleased to recognize them. Uh, let the, in, so the award, the bronze award for total building area, uh, it was over 6.7 million square feet. So for, for some of us, that's a career, but for uh, Patrick Haswell and Don Sylvia, in Boston, uh, that was just a regular everyday year. Um, for some of us, that that might have taken 20. Um, and I want to recognize our, our our good friends at Vicinity have actually uh, 
uh, brought home uh, a number of awards. Uh, so before I introduce our, 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 our presenter from vicinity, uh, let me also uh, recognize an another winner from, uh, from Boston. Well, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think that's the way we're gonna play it. I think we're, uh, so our silver award, we're vicinity energy, number of buildings in Philadelphia, 74 uh, uh, in last year in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, receiving that award in, uh, include uh, Trisha Brown and Thomas Lyons. And I think Mike Smedley is also on the, on the line. So um, uh, if they can open their, uh, there's Trisha with her award from uh, Philadelphia. Trish, congratulations. Thank you. Very good. Yes. And uh, Go then the silver award for total building area also goes to Philly. You're like, I don't know if any of you watched the Emmy Awards. I think it was Emmy Awards. I don't want to say Philadelphia is the Shits Creek of, uh, of <laughs> IDEA because that wouldn't be nice and I don't have a sign to hang up. But congratulations uh, that two, uh, two <clears throat> awards. Well done, Philadelphia. Well done. Uh, following a Super Bowl, I might add. And last year in Philadelphia, they connected or had committed over 18 million square feet. That is really significant. So congratulations, uh, Tricia and team, Thomas and, uh, um, and Mike, uh, Mike Smedley. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the vicinity group, you know, they're active in 19 different locations. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, spokesman for today, Allison Porter. Director of Sales Operations. Uh, and Allison, um, love to hear from you. Great. Can you hear me okay, Rob? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we're managing our social distancing while we um, enjoy our award ceremony here, getting as real as we can here in Boston. So thank you so much for having us. Um, and, and thank you for, again, we're very, very proud of the work in both uh, the Boston teams and the Philadelphia teams work very hard to retain our customers in increasingly competitive environments um, with many challenges. So thank you again, Rob, to you and your team for recognizing us. Um, we're quite proud of what we accomplished in 2019. Go ahead, Kristen. So vicinity might be a new name for some of you. Um, we were uh, previously owned by Veolia Energy North America. Um, we were acquired by a private equity firm at the end of 2019. Um, and so we serve, uh, we're in the 19 markets now in the U.S. We just recently added one in Morgantown, West Virginia, and also the Watergate apartment complex in Washington, D.C. So we're very excited about those two uh, recent acquisitions and that space, which we'll, maybe we'll see you again next year, Rob, um, for the, these awards, given that we've added significantly to our portfolio here in 2020. Um, we serve almost um, 250 million square feet of commercial space in the U.S. with both our heating and cooling assets in these markets. Um, our new owners are very excited to grow our business, so we again anticipate significant growth over the course of the next few years um, of all of our business, and they're investing heavily in our infrastructure and also um, in some very forward-thinking growth in our um, in our low carbon future and certainly in the um, growth of space. So if you have any questions about vicinity or the company, please feel free to reach out to myself or my colleagues. Next slide, Kristen. So just last week, vicinity rolled out our clean energy future. So we have a new um, low carbon plan and a sustainability plan for vicinity 2050. Um, and our goal is to reach net zero carbon emissions for 2050. And it's a very ambitious goal. Um, we have um, obviously some very large assets in the United States in our district energy um, markets and some large CHP assets, but we've worked very hard to um, reduce our carbon footprint over the last several years. Um, I've been with the company over 10 years and have seen significant investments in um, uh, reducing our carbon footprint already. And we look forward to um, our you know, new ownership groups and this new plan uh, to further reduce our carbon moving forward. Can move to the next slide for some of the details here. 
So many of you know that, as Rob mentioned, um, IDEA has been around since 1918, and many of our systems have been around since the 20s and 30s as well. So we've really been able to move with the history of the industry. Um, we, you know, many of our systems started with coal burning assets, oil burning assets, um, and moved to natural gas. Then we implemented large scale CHP in several of our largest systems in the early 2000s. Um, it, we're now moving towards this, the, the next generation, which is looking at distributed generation assets throughout our portfolio, integration of small CHP, and then looking for the future of new fuels. So we're looking to transition to this completely net zero carbon future by looking at renewable fuels, biofuels. We're looking at electrification, which is a very interesting goal of some of our more progressive cities and customers. Um, so that's been an interesting angle. Obviously, most of us haven't considered electrification as a uh, large scale solution for district energy, but it's really coming more and more realistic every day as the carbon footprint of our electricity portfolios here in New England and on the East Coast especially continue to come down. We're also looking at storage. So uh, the storage market has changed significantly over the last five or 10 years. There's many different battery solutions and hydrogen based solutions that are out there. So we have some test pilot programs going and are really looking at all of those angles to be part of this low carbon future. So it's going to sort of be a, a phased approach. As you might imagine, there is no major switch to flip to get rid of the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning at our assets to be able to provide the reliability to our customers today. However, we are um, running some programs already on these renewable fuels, some pilots, and are um, well on our way to creating a path forward to a completely clean future. So um, we think our customers are very excited about this. Our prospects are excited, our owners are excited. So we look forward to continuing to discuss this with uh, the members of the IDEA. So please reach out with any questions that you all may have. Uh, and we thank you again, Rob and Kristen, for welcoming us here today. Here's my email address and uh, the Vicinity Energy website. Please go ahead and check us out. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome, Allison. Great job. And uh, I just want to, again, congratulate you and, uh, and your team in Boston, uh, 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 Don Sylvia and Patrick Haswell. Uh, I know it's a much bigger team uh, than, than all of you. Uh, and then in Philadelphia, uh, our friends Trish Brown, Tom Lyons, and Mike Smedley. Uh, you know, there's a there is some friendly rivalry between Boston and Philadelphia. Uh, you know, if you look at you know sort of the NBA, uh, the Sixers and the Celtics uh, have have often been uh, you know uh, friendly competitors. But it's it's nice to see uh, at a at a mission level, you know, vicinity really is uh, uh, you know accelerating for your future, uh, looking to make. Uh, clean, uh, cleaner and, and uh, renewable solutions. And we'll come back to that. I've got a couple of questions for your group, but uh, really congratulations. Uh, that's, that's a lot of achievement, a lot of growth in one year. And I, uh, and I know it, it's, that's not easy. So well done and really applaud you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Rob. You're welcome, Allison. Thanks. Um, and then finally, our uh, final award, goes to actually uh, this recipient is winning the gold award uh, both for the number of buildings uh, committed. So uh, the energy services acquisition program uh, in Ottawa, which is a part of the public services and procurement Canada. So for, uh, for those of us in, uh, in the U S uh, th they're analogous to our GSA, the general services administration, I think in, in many ways. Uh, uh, but really pleased to recognize uh, ESAP uh, and 88 buildings last year. And then as well in terms of square footage, uh, nine, over 19 million square feet uh, connected. And uh, for those of you who uh, like me have uh, watched and listened and learned from our, our friends at uh, ESAP, uh, Tomas uh, Smetny Soa and Donald Grant, you, we all know that this wasn't an overnight success, uh, that they didn't achieve this uh, just in 2019. Uh, you know, this conclusion, this work, this kind of culmination, I think probably required a decade's worth of effort, uh, but it really does, I think, uh, this is an opportunity to congratulate our colleagues from ESAP and, uh, 
uh, I'd like to welcome, uh, um, I think Don, are you gonna give the, oh, you're, Don, there's Don Grant yeah. holding up the, the certificate. Don, uh, maybe a little higher, like uh, like the Stanley Cup. Yeah. <laughs> well, like this. Yeah. I don't even know like this. But, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well done. Thank you, Don. And, uh, and then I think uh, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Tomas, who's going to share with us, uh, you know, the, this, uh, this journey uh, that's very much underway. And Tomas Metnisoa from the Energy Services Acquisition Program in Ottawa. Uh, congratulations, Tomas. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, thanks a lot. We're very proud of this, of this award. Uh, and you're right, it took us 10 years to get where we are. Uh, we started in 2009, so it was a long journey. And uh, you know very well because we were all along and uh, so we tried to join uh, uh, the rank of actually uh, very well and more than district energy systems. And finally, we're getting there slowly but surely. So I will let Don to run through the presentation. He is much better in this than me. So, but any questions that <laughs> I will be able to answer to. Don, go ahead. All right, thanks, Tomas. So yes, we're gonna hear from uh, Tomas a couple of times in the presentation, just a couple of points. Uh, but I'll go over some of the higher points for us. So um, I, I, I'm very impressed that you noted Shit's Creek. Uh, that's a Canadian show, in case you didn't know, but uh, you, if you listen closely, I'm sure there's a few A's in there. Um, so where are we? We are the, the nation's capital. We're uh, near Montreal. Uh, I like putting this slide up there so people get a bit of a sense of, as to where we are. The other thing that's interesting is it's not just the city of Ottawa, but also the neighboring city of Gatineau, Quebec. And so we're not twin cities. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's another language. It's French on the other side of the river. And um, we really don't get along that well in terms of municipal infrastructure. It's a bit of a struggle between the two provinces. Um, so our, our success is one that is, is really fun and quite nice because we will have facilities on both sides of the river uh, and there's some really strong advantages to that. So uh, next slide, please. So we have five plants in the downtown core and uh, one, or sorry, four in the core and then one that's just outside of the core. Uh, so this is right zooming in on, on, on the downtown. The one that's Bar Cliff, that's right next to our Parliament Hill, uh, which is where we get where the Prime Minister presides over Parliament. Uh, we have uh, one facility that's uh, the National Petit Bureau in Quebec. Uh, we have one in Tony's Pasture, which is just a little, little ways out. Another one that's uh, we're going to decommission, which is uh, labeled by the NRC, the National Research Council. And the last is the Confederation Heights. Just a couple of things. Uh, this journey, as, as Rob mentioned and, and Tomas uh, 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 alluded to, it's about uh, building this network out again, rebuilding it. So, in fact, the National Printing Bureau was connected to the rest of the, of the network at one time. We disconnected it, we'll reconnect it again. That's why the connection's in red. Uh, we're extending the connection from Cliff to Tony's Pasture. That's a uh, two and a half kilometers, so I don't know, a uh, mile and a half or so. Uh, and uh, we're adding another connection over to the Quebec side. And so uh, the thing about the, the, the work that we're doing is uh, it took about 10 years to get a contract in place and that contract finally uh, started uh, this past year. And so this year was really, it made sense that 2019 would be the year that we recognize the connections on the system. So if you go to the next slide, please. So we really have three stages in mind. We have, we're right in, right in the, the starting part, which is the stage one. And for those of you who don't know, it's a conversion from mostly steam and high temperature hot water to low temperature hot water. And a, and a conversion as well from uh, steam chillers to uh, steam driven chillers to electric chillers. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about this stage that relates to this, uh, to this award and why we're so proud of this award is we have to go in and reconnect every one of the buildings that agreed to stay connected to the system. So uh, when we look at this as being at the, uh, an award for reconnection, it's, it's with a lot of uh, pain and a lot of work to get each of these buildings uh, up and running. So, um, so that's the main thing for us. We also have some ambitious goals, which uh, include uh, switching over to low carbon fuels. Uh, our, we have an ambitious target, which is to be carbon neutral by 2030 on both the heating and the cooling. Uh, we'll be 100% uh, uh, carbon free by 2025 on the cooling because we are able to take advantage of carbon free electricity in Quebec. Um, we're looking at ways to manage and only have natural gas as a 
for, for peaking. Um, and then we're also preparing to expand to even more buildings. I've got a slide out in a second. Um, and so basically we want to look at connecting as many buildings as we can to the downtown core as we move out beyond 2025, which is the point at which we'll be finished the DES work. Uh, and I wondered, Tomas, if you just wanted to say a couple of words about uh, how hard some of this work was and what you see for the future. I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. So <laughs> keep forgetting about that. Yeah. Keep talking and nothing happened. Uh, yes, uh, it, it was, as Rob said, 10 years of, of uh, hard work. And don't forget, we have federal government, two provinces, and and city divided by the by the river with a kind of different political, uh, economical, and social aspects. So, getting it all together at the one district and the system wasn't a, a easy a easy feat, but uh, we managed to get that. And obviously, as soon as we managed to get the system uh, converted, everybody's asking why are you still on natural gas, why you don't switch right away to the natural to the something that is carbon neutral. And uh, as you know, it, there's no magic solution. We're very fortunate in Canada because our grid in, on Quebec side is only four grams per kilowatt hour of, of carbon. So it's extremely low, it's, it's practically clean. So we, under this program of work, we're moving our production capacity for the chilling uh, into the Quebec. So uh, there's a bit of difficulty to move some energy between the provinces. So electricity won't be able to do that, but uh, lucky for us, chilled water <laughs> or hot water yeah. is not part of this agreement. So yeah. we are able to produce in Quebec and shift it over to Ontario. So yeah. that's how I was planning to get this uh, system to be carbon neutral. Connection of new building, it's another story. As you know, it used to be the federal government system and federal government uh, wasn't really interested in growing the system beyond the federal government people. So it took a lot of convincing to make sure that, yes, we can offer that to other buildings, to not necessarily federal government, but other provincial government, municipal government, and strictly private building. So we do have uh, two private buildings on a, on a line, and that helped us uh, to push the envelope a bit further. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, so next slide, Krista. <laughs> So this is just that we, we plan to add more buildings. We'd like to stay in competition for these awards. We like these awards. And so this is a, a, a different map that shows you uh, in green the areas where we see potential growth. So we'll, we'll be able to add buildings in the downtown core. Along the red line, we've got a note that says uh, a new supply of the Breton Flats. That's a new a residential commercial area that's going to have a significant growth over the next little while. Uh, in addition, uh, Tunney's Pasture is being converted as a government from a government campus to being another large mixed-use campus that will uh, where we have an opportunity to connect buildings. We have a new hospital coming, and we're just in very preliminary discussions about possibly extending the line down to the new hospital. And then just after the hospital, we've got uh, Carleton University, and then that would give us an opportunity to connect uh, to Confederation Heights, the one plant that isn't on the connection to our system. So this is all. Very exciting stuff for us. Uh, Kristen, next slide. And when, when we dream big, and this is really a Tomas slide, there is a possibility that we could do some really amazing things. And so one would be to go all the way up to our west end, where there are some uh, very large uh, uh, government buildings there, mostly on the security side and the military side. And so that's Carling Campus and Shirley's Bay. It would be very good to connect those buildings. And uh, we're believers that waste from energy or, or energy from waste, whichever way you want to put it, is a good potential. And so, you know, we would like to see one day being able to have that as a possibility. We'd be happy to take all of the heat energy away from the site. Uh, next slide. Well, this is the thank you slide. And this is the beautiful picture uh, that we have of our new uh, energy systems by the Supreme Court. I just want to turn it back over one last time to Mass for any Final words to ask. You're on mute still. <laughs> and again, I'm talking without the mic. I, my apologies, that's me. Uh, no, I just want to thank Rob for all the hard work they're doing. And I think this organization is, is fantastic. And I really miss our meetings. 
amount of information and and the the links with the different people that happens during this annual and semi-annual events is tremendous and it cannot be replaced by the, the zoom it, it's better than nothing no thank you very much for doing it but it's not even close to the actual physical interaction with people and from all all kind of district energy system all kind of you know cities problems it's great great opportunity thank you very much rob and thanks a lot for recognizing us well you're welcome uh you've done all the hard work you and don and i, and I know there's a team behind uh the success here uh you know i'm reminded of the greek hero sisyphus damas where you know destiny is to push the boulder up the hill and then it rolls back down and then you push the boulder up again and you know and i know this project don this project um has had its ups and downs the you know some some real challenges but uh, you know i'd like to commend you both for being sisyphus uh, being un, undaunted and uh you know getting it to this point clearly there's uh, a lot more work to, to to be done to achieve the full vision of this um, and and like you, Tomas, I'm disappointed that you know we're not able to be together physically because I think IBEA really is about peer exchange and and experience and success and sharing the bruises as well as the success. Uh, and in fact, our plan was for you to be presenting this information in Washington D.C. this past June, so that your counterparts from Washington could see that in fact it is possible you know, to do this, that it is possible for government uh, and private partners to collaborate and, uh, and, and achieve great things. So uh, hats off uh, to, to, to the two of you and uh, congratulations on this recognition. I wanna, uh, you know, before I open it up for questions, uh, I do wanna congratulate all of our winners in 2020 uh, for sharing, uh, you know, your success, your information, it, it is the vital, it's the DNA of, of IDEA, you know, where, you know, we, we can kind of come together, um, you know, share information, be of resource to each other. And so uh, to Clearway Energy, uh, Vicinity, and ESAP, uh, our friends in, in the public service in, the, in, in Ottawa, congratulations. Um, I have, uh, I think I'm going to move into a, a Q&A segment now. So to all of uh, all of the panelists, if you would all unmute, uh, and that way, um, you know, you can you can jump in as you uh, as you please. Um, so, you know, one of the things, if you if we think back to the the graphs of you know kind of customer uh, um, uh, growth in in IDA, you know, from your perspectives, to what to what do you attribute that? You know, what if, from your view. Why are customers connecting? What are, are there, you know, some reasons that, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of take take precedent or the, what's making customers recognize and, and become users of district energy? And who would like to respond? I can go in. Tomas. So, so, so Rob, I think it changed. Before, I think a lot of that was attributed to ease of operation of the building. Uh, you move away responsibility, environmental problems and stuff like that to somebody else. Uh, the building is operating by itself. But now it's changed. I think a lot of customers right now recognizing a green possibility that you can do through the district energy system versus individually in the building. We did a lot of studies. Um, for, for our own buildings, government buildings. And it, it costs so much more if you go building by building uh, per ton of GHG versus if you use the district energy system. So I think that will be more and more, uh, it will be easier for us to connect new buildings if we have a green fuel. Right. Uh, anyone else uh, care to comment? What's, uh, you know, what do you think is driving growth in your communities? Uh, we're definitely seeing a large increase here in the biotechnology and pharmaceutical space, which we're very fortunate to have that business here in Boston. Um, we're blessed with some of the greatest universities in the country, some of which are served by our district energy, some of which have their own networks, right, the Harvard and MIT. Um, but those universities and their presence here and all of the 
talent that comes out of those schools really has driven a lot of technology corporations to take up residence here, but especially those very energy intensive biotechs and labs. And we are very happy to have them. They make the best customers on our districts. Um, they're very excited about our carbon plan, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and we expect to see big things in the future right here in Boston and Cambridge. And, and that um, growth is expanding into our other cities as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see what COVID is going to do to change that. But we were seeing some expansion in the biotech space in um, some of our other cities as well. And Allison and, 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 to, and to others, I'm assuming that a, a sophisticated biotech customer really probably applies a premium to reliability and resiliency. Is you that one of the drivers, you know, really your, you like your job is 24 seven, 365, highly service. reliable thermal energy. Is, is that also a factor in, in their, you know, your growth? That's exactly it. They're buying the delivered product. You know, they're right. buying the energy as a service, not seeing us as a commodity. They want to completely outsource that function to a third party. They don't want energy assets on site. They have enough equipment and enough risk to be worrying about. They want that off their plate. So um, reliability is certainly paramount. And um, they, you know, we could really get into very detailed discussions about we're doing it, what we're doing at our plant for resiliency on electricity, on water sources, on fuel storage, and what's going to happen. I think these, uh, you know, all the blackouts we've seen in California, yes. that's going to refocus that conversation. Um, it's scared a lot of businesses yeah. and residents, right? Um, and, and I think is continuing to drive huh. that resiliency conversation here and um, especially in this market, especially for those biotechs, you're exactly right. Um, I think COVID has put another level of focus on resiliency for medical centers as well, as we would expect. So, yes. um, so we're we're hoping that will again drive um, growth and interest in district energy in the future. Yes, good point. Anyone anyone care to add? I would. I would like to add sure. a Philly perspective. Um, we're also known as the third utility. People don't talk about. And I think a lot of our growth and why we are being successful is we're out marketing, we're out educating people, we're reminding them that we're still here, even though we're 100 years old, district energy is still viable, it's still here, and it's all about education and marketing the brand. Um, if you don't, they're going to forget about us. So that's really helped in the Philly area. Yeah, uh, clearly, uh, you know, district energy has been in the infrastructure of Philadelphia for literally a century and, uh, and significant investment in the assets over, you know, the past years of the 30 plus years I've been in the industry, you know, Philly has really, uh, I think, uh, you know, really paid attention to the customer base and stayed in front and, and you know, maintaining competitiveness. So Trish, I, I'd echo, you know, you, you really do need to remind them uh, that, you know, you're here, uh, you're available, and, uh, uh, and you're a resource. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else care to uh, comment? Uh, um, yeah, maybe I can add in, Rob. Yeah, in, in a market like New York, especially, again, we don't have a lot of assets here, but we do have a lot of conversations around with district energy. And I think, you know, in a market like New York, I mean, space savings can really add up, right? I mean, right. the amount of space you can save there in a premium market, and when you kind of see the west side of New York here, and I, I sit a few blocks away from it here, uh, you know, they have a district energy plant that they've built supplying them steam and, and the separate, that part of west part of New York, the Hudson Yards, which uh, somebody once told me it's the uh, equivalent amount of uh, office space was built on the west side of New York as the country of uh, Norway. So I'm mean, just to kind of give you a sense of how much development has happened there. Uh, and it's all, you know, connected to district energy. Uh, supported by a developer, they're related, but a lot of it is space savings premium and the, the reliability that comes from it. Because I remember, you know, it's New York City, but it always seems to still find a way to kind of lose its lights. And I remember just a year ago when the lights went out and they were just coming away, no issues. Yes, I, you know, I think, um, you know, what was somewhat common among the presentations, uh, and, and Samira, I, I would agree, you know, you know uh, knowing New York, it's so vertically dense you know, uh, that space is at a premium. And I was really surprised to learn that even sub sub basement in Manhattan has huge retail value. So being able to sort of, you know, remove mechanical equipment and replace it with, you know, even a deli, you know, or, 
uh, shoe repair is, is significant income opportunity for that building owner. And so by, by sort of outsourcing or offsourcing, offshoring, you know, that generation asset, it, it, it really does generate huge value for our members. They don't always recognize it. They don't always share that with you. But in fact, that's in their, in their analysis for sure. Um, let, what, um, looking ahead, uh, so in, in Pittsburgh, there was a uh, discussion of scale and aggregation you know, as a driver and utilizing excess capacity. Uh, certainly we're seeing that in Ottawa. Um, but I, I think in Boston and Philadelphia, is there, uh, you know, is there kind of a, uh, in your strategy, uh, is aggregation and assimilation a, a, an important attribute? Just having a growing network? Uh, is, do, do you see that as contributing to your success? Any thoughts there? Certainly. I mean, it, it... I'll take a first shot at it. Uh, it's certainly at Clearway, that's definitely the 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 way that we look at this. When we look at uh, a city, I mean, and with Ali, we literally take a look at the map and say, okay, where is this physical infrastructure, thermal energy behind the grid that we can pick up and bring to district energy configuration? You know, where is there a boiler here, boiler there? So we certainly look at geographies that way, both in kind of local places where we exist or in other uh, new areas that we might be looking to enter to say, okay, where are the pieces of the puzzles that we could put together to bring together a district energy configuration? Right, yeah, so nodal development and kind of integration uh, over, uh, you know, over time, uh, strategic yes. growth, yes. And now, I think Allison, did you wanna comment? I think especially with the, um, the larger landlords in some of these cities, that's the first thing they want to know, right, is who have you been signing up and what what is your recent growth look like? Um, and can we talk to those people and how what has been their experience? Um, to Trisha's point, we are a lesser known utility in most right. of these cities. Um, so that has been key, I think, reputationally, that we continue to show growth, drive growth, and then be able to um, connect those end users. But we have the same thing that we're looking at um, large pockets of each of our cities where we can run new laterals because our owners are so excited about um, investing in kind of large growth, reaching new neighborhoods. So whether it be a neighborhood that doesn't exist yet um, yeah. or one that is just coming out of the ground where we could get you know buildings one and two as anchors um, or maybe it's going after a large pocket of those um, buildings that might need conversion, those older boilers or, or yes. chillers. Yes. And there are different drivers in cities too. Of course, like uh, you know, in Manhattan, there's a uh, you know over the in the last decade, there's been a moratorium on using uh, you know oil in buildings, and so sometimes there are these externalities that sort of you know I think leverage a district energy solution. Uh, um, I wanted to get to a couple of questions we we had from audience. So uh, to, to the question about uh, annual growth percentage for CHPs or uh, uh, combined heat and power. Um, uh, that does exist. We don't record that specifically. We, we do have some data, but it, 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 isn't, uh, it isn't aggregated or managed uh, like this, this particular report on district energy. But um, there's a, a resource. Uh, if you go to the Department of Energy EERE CHP, uh, there's quite a bit of data there, uh, and that may be of help to you. So, um, uh, We'll, uh, we'll follow up uh, with that questioner. Uh, next question we had, so district energy, we all know has been around for a century, uh, but now we're, the power generation is really changing dramatically. Uh, you know, uh, certainly distributed generation, solar, wind, you know, obviously tax, uh, tax policy has been driving that. On the horizon, are there any new technologies emerging for district energy to accelerate carbon reduction? Uh, any thoughts there from our, our panelists? Sure. No, I, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's, it's really, really remarkable. I kind of remember, uh, you know, right out of college, I was started at Clearway and I first started working on coal plants. And, you know, I remember working on coal plants, like, how horrible is this? And I remember gas kind of coming in and, and we went to a future and I've had a chance over my career to work on coal and then nuclear plants and then gas plants. And, wind plants and solar plants and we have one of the largest portfolio of renewables in our fleet but what always surprised me was the speed of that change i mean how quickly i mean i, you know, I remember as 
as a company us investing half a billion dollars on coal assets and within two years we were turning them off. And so I think a lot of our, uh, uh, I, I actually think there's a sense of complacency in thinking that we have a longer runway than we do. And I think there is a mix of technologies. I think there, you know, whether it's, I mean, people looking at hydrogen and batteries and electrification and there's different state mandates to get there. I think the key thing is going to be, to, you know, how that conversation is being driven. Is it state driven and state incentivized like you see in California? where there's kind of the government is stepping up and signing long-term agreements to make the grid green, mm -hmm. or is the market going to play out? In many ways, Texas today has much of a more cleaner grid than in many other places, and they simply invested in transmission, and they're getting it through wind and people coming in and developing or using market mechanisms. So it's a big country. I kind of, you know, I remember having conversations around district energy being in Kentucky, and when they say clean energy, they meant getting off coal. So it's not a uniform conversation across the country, and I think it is moving in a certain direction, but I think it is the speed of that change. If you think of what happened in the last 10 years between, you know, as a kid out of college, I started from coal to gas and to and now renewables, and essentially there's articles today, and if you look at what Southern Company is doing with divestment of gas assets and others, that uh, we, you might be at a peak of the gas utilization in the U.S., and more of it will get exported. Uh, some people think we're at the top of the gas cycle. So I think there's going to be a different mix of technologies that ultimately get to carbon neutrality. And that's great to kind of hear that conversation from colleagues as well, because that's what the customers want. Yes. Uh, th uh, thanks, Samir. I, I mean, you, you know, I, I've often believed in, in my experience, you know, I, I think one of the attributes that's sort of maybe not as appreciated as much is that district energy, by aggregating 10, 20 million square feet of customer space, really what happens is you enable, you know, these technologies because there is a thermal scale, right? That you, you really couldn't, I don't think would pencil on a building by building basis. So, you know, it, at a community scale, you can do waste, you know, waste energy or, um, you know, thermal storage or CHP. You know, I think, I, I think that's always been sort of one of our hidden attributes. Um, but, you know, I, and I think too, there is new pressure on all of us to decarbonize and, uh, and, you know, and demonstrate sincerity and, and, you know, technology implementation as well. And, and, but moreover influencing policy, uh, because I, I think oftentimes it isn't, I'm, I'm, I'm saying too much, I'm talking too much. It isn't the technology. It's really sometimes the policies that enable, uh, you know, um, the industry to grow. Don, yes. Uh, so just a few notes from uh, from Canada. So uh, right now, the, uh, the current federal government is a strong supporter of decarbonization. So that's a big benefit for us. Uh, we switched over at the uh, provincial level, and uh, it's not quite the same uh, level of support there. Um, we have uh, you know incredible resource in Quebec in that their hydro has been green. It's not quite nine percent green. It has been for a long time. Uh, but one of the things to look for from us is going to be uh, our experiments of geo exchange on a community level. So when we look at uh, Le Breton Flats, which we talked about, and uh, Tony's Pasture, uh, in both cases, the, the the ultimate landlord is the government of Canada, and one of the uh, goals is to have everybody net zero ready uh, right. moving forward. But the question is going to be, okay, if we sell this land to a developer, how are we going to restrict the developer to, to go with net zero? And even if we get them to buy in, sort of the nightmare scenario is each property drills wells into the ground and uh, runs them by themselves. And so we're really hoping to promote a vision of community-based geo-exchange so that right. uh, an ESAP would run it. So it would be our business with our business partners um, like uh, NG. And uh, we would look at uh, having these as community-based resources even in and out of the, the larger district energy system. And so if we're having a good day with geo, maybe the more is coming from it. If it's a bad day, maybe less. Uh, rather than having this nightmare scenario, we've got an example here in the city where um, uh, a building, uh, they were dumping too much uh, heat into the ground in the summer and their, their cooling conked out. And so that was a serious problem. So uh, it does get hot in Ottawa, believe it or not. So yeah. yes. Anyways, that's, uh, that's one of the things to look for from us in the future. Right. Yeah, I think I think scale and aggregation, but certainly a a, a basket of technologies too, right? So you know uh, you have the Darwin and you know basically Darwin and flexibility of supply and uh, optimizing as well. Um, anyone else, uh, you know, have a have a comment or a thought on 
you know, how does our industry accelerate uh, to a lower carbon uh, uh, model? Uh, we certainly agree with you, Rob, that we need the policy to back up what we're doing. Um, we have, uh, you know, grand plans, but also a conflict in policy in terms of what CHP is getting for um, local funding in each of our states, um, what they'll do for future distributed generation and CHP assets, um, and then certainly the future of all these renewable fuels that are coming out on the market, too. Um, there, there needs to be some heavy focus on funding those or else they're not going to pencil anytime soon. I think we all recognize that. Um, so we have quite a ways to go. So we, we certainly look to you and your organization for support and to our colleagues here for continued um, kind of support on that front as we all move forward, because I think it's yeah. the same challenge everywhere. Yeah, I think I think there are sort of universal, you know, uh, policy challenges and and what, you know, a, a forward look looking uh, policy in one state, maybe it can be it can, you know, be metastasized in others, right? You know, part of what our job, I think, is to, you know, link and share. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't always have the uh, the resources to uh, punch all 50, you know, punch the no. above weight in all 50 states. No. Um, but clearly, uh, you know, there are, uh, there's a need for voice. And, uh, you know, and, and we, we intend to do the do what we can in that regard. In one state somewhere else. Um, let, let me just uh, an another question we had, and, uh, and so thinking about COVID, I guess there's a couple of sort of uh, views. One question is, you, you know, do you anticipate that COVID will have a deleterious effect on downtowns? Do you, do you see, you know, uh, perhaps uh, vacancies, you know, continuing or you know, challenge from that? Um, so that's one question. Then the second question um, is more of a lemonade question, sort of making lemonade from this lemon of COVID. With our institutions and the challenges they're facing economically, does COVID now represent perhaps a leverage opportunity for the, pri the P3 approach, you know, the, the private partnering, bringing uh, technology and industry partners towards uh, maybe, uh, you know, municipal institutions, uh, government agencies that are going to be, frankly, uh, you know, I think dealing with the impact of COVID and, you know, tax revenue, et cetera. So two questions. Um, the negative of COVID, you know, do you, do you foresee uh, vacancies as, as a challenge? And then the yin and then the yang is, does COVID really now create more opportunity for partnering? We've certainly seen some initial challenges um, in, you know, space vacancy. That's a no-brainer. Um, it happened kind of in the in a shoulder month, but now we're coming back into heating season here in New England, where I am um, most uh, familiar. But I'm um, for all of you, right? Um, so, so that is definitely a no-brainer. But beyond that, I think we see exposure in our. Um, you know, hotels and convention mm -hmm. rent revenues, retail and restaurant space, um, which is varying degrees of impacts across our portfolio, um, depending on what city you may be in. So I, I think what happens with the university market is a we'll see. Um, they're figuring it out on the fly, just like we are. Um, and same with commercial office. We see some, some companies sending their employees back to the office. Some companies are out until um, next summer, next fall. So um, it's a definitely a wait and see from that perspective. On the opportunity side, I think we definitely recognize that there will be um, some cash constrained industries and businesses out there, um, certainly municipalities as well, that may have been um, considering complete rehab and replacement of gas fuel assets that will now turn to us as a better solution. So we're looking forward to that as a um, certainly a positive side of the coin from a COVID perspective. Right. right. Good points. Thanks, Allison. Anyone else have, uh, have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I would just, I would say from our perspective, uh, the, you know, the early results were that uh, there wasn't a significant impact in the, in the Ottawa Gatineau market in terms of the, uh, the space demand. It's all going to depend on the federal government. So what we do uh, is really going to have an impact and we really have to balance a number of things. So, just recently, uh, we were reminded of the fact that uh, if we're working on secure files, we can't do that. So there are going to be, I think it's going to be a hybrid model in Ottawa. 
Um, in terms of the rest of the economy that isn't government related, uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. We have, uh, you know, uh, our current sweetheart of the, of the high tech industry is Shopify, and they've said no one's going back to work. We are going to uh, vacate all of our office space. So it's going to be uh, difficult to see what happens. Uh, but I also think that there are opportunities in terms of um, redensifying. We happen to be in a city that's got a fair amount of sprawl, so there might be some conversions or other opportunities. Uh, to convert space rather than just to lose it. But uh, the net result, like for us, the immediate result for us will be what's going to happen to these uh, major redevelopments at Tunney's Pasture and the Brenton Flats. Will they go as fast as they're predicted to go? But, but at the same time, Don, maybe they get repurposed, right? So they become sort of mixed use uh, as opposed to, you know, pure uh, office or, you know, yeah. You know, I, I, I think I, I think I think the one thing we know we know is we don't know. Yeah, really. Like uh, Ron Rumsfeld, the unknown unknowns. I, I don't I don't get into that. Uh, so uh, we uh, we've we extended beyond our hour. And I, and I just want to sort of bring this to, uh, you know, maybe some concluding remarks uh, from uh, from our panel. And thank you so much for your your helpful sharing, you know. Where do we, uh, you know, if you could kind of crystal ball this, where do you see the, oh no, I'm sorry. I really, I should have addressed the, another question from the audience, sorry. So um, what is the source of the heat? I know that some of you are using, uh, you know, heat recovered from CHP. Some are using, uh, you know, our, our gas fired and combinations and some are using geothermal and heat pumps. So uh, if you could just, you know, Really, what are, what do you, in terms of the sources of heats, do you see that evolving, uh, and and how quickly? Any thoughts there, Tomas? Definitely, all evolve for sure, and mainly because of the greening, and there's a lot of pressure to switch from natural gas to something that is less harmful to the environment. Uh, but the challenge going back to COVID is that a lot of municipalities and even the government, federal government will be cash strapped. They, they spoke so much money for the assistance program. I don't know how it's on the south of the border, but in our side, they, they, they keep spending money left, right, center, trying to help people to get through this. And eventually, eventually there will there, there'll be no more money available. So I think the programs of greening will slow down a little bit but there will be a definite driver to switch fuel from natural gas to something that is green. And, and Allison, you mentioned uh, in your remarks about biofuels and, and sort of, you know, renewable fuel, you know, and, and I think one of the challenges currently, uh, you know, uh, renewable gas, really there's a, it, it, it gets a much higher tax uh, credit or rec when used in transportation. Right, so it really it, it it pulls that volume, whatever's available, towards fleets as opposed to you know our fixed generating assets. So so is that a policy problem? A volume problem? Is it a, a maturity? You know, uh, I guess it's really all of the above, right? You know, I agree with that. Yeah, I think it is all of the above, I and mean, we we certainly see transportation as an easier target for some of those fuels. Um, but it's definitely an availability the issue that it's a cost issue. Um, certainly, you know, there's customers out there who say they may want a reduced carbon footprint, but are they willing to pay 5x, 10x, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a huge question that um, some of our more progressive consumers may be more interested in than others, of course. Um, so I, I think it's both. We have a long way to go on that front. So, mm -hmm. uh, so right now we're working in the pilot space. Um, we're trying to, and, and we're trying to look at all different, um, all different ideas, especially yeah. to pick off those peaks, right, and, and get rid of the oil. It's like, let's start there. Um, in uh, in most of our markets, we're still burning oil on those peak days, um, and and that seems like the relatively speaking low hanging fruit um, to try and recapture. So. Yeah. When, yeah. I, I, when, when, go ahead, please. Yeah, I do think the more forward thinking you are as an industry, the more you're going to get in terms of policy benefits as well. I mean, <laughs> the fact that electrification of car infrastructure is starting to see the benefits, whether it's through hydrogen or battery of governmental policy leading in their direction is not a surprise. And I think that's the aspect of it, the, uh, the energy side of it that's unique. If you think about wind and solar, they essentially got the benefit of um, 
you know, uh, subsidies through a 20% difference between what a CHP gets and what uh, what they get, which is a 30% ITC versus 10% on our asset class, right? So there's a 20% difference and they can, and that, by the way, I mean, I'm a finance guy, that 20%, you can, it's significant. With a 10%, you cannot access tax equity in our asset class. But the other thing that's really unique is that you have an entire uh, other industry, the automated and automotive industry, trying to solve the battery problem which will further accelerate the cost declines in energy. You know, energy uh, as uh, battery as a commodity in energy is being subsidized by yet completely another completely sector. And you've never had that before in energy. So I think the changes that are gonna come out of that effort are, are gonna be more meaningful. But again, they're coming out because that is the most forward leading industry today relative to saying, okay, we're gonna go try to go electrification of, of car infrastructure. Again, how it gets done, California mandates or through market structures and cars being $20,000 through Tesla, you know, is, is the, the, the magic is somewhere in between. Yeah, well, uh, clearly uh, policy, uh, you know, economic drivers like production tax credits, invest credits, uh, RECs, or, you know, requiring, you know, the, uh, the grid to purchase or pay, you know, for renewable energy, that, that certainly, you know, drives investment and it has. I think oftentimes, you know, our side of the ledger, the thermal energy, we're sort of, I don't, I don't know if any of you are old enough like me to remember uh, this advertising campaign, pork, the other white meat. You know, I think, I think sometimes, you know, district energy is sort of, you know, the, the other uh, thermal energy is the, you know, the sort of the forgotten resource. Um, uh, Definitely going to steal that one, Rob, yeah, and right, use it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, I'm not sure it's going to get you anywhere, but uh, and, and and then finally, you know, one of the uh, one one question that came in before we close um, is: uh, Are any of the district energy systems moving to fourth or fifth generation by reducing supply temperature? And I know that's in the design in Ottawa, you know, uh, shifting from steam to hot water, low, lower temperature hot water, but that also entails though converting the buildings as well, right? So it isn't just uh, ch changing the, the supply and distribution, it's a, um, you know, it's a full game. Um, uh, Tomas, uh, Don, that is in fact the case, yes? So I can attest to what you just said. We started with ambitious goal to go to 70 degrees C supply temperature. And very quickly we realized that uh, the cost of conversion of the building will be prohibitive. And we brought the temperature to 95 degrees C um, and what we have as a policy in national capital region right now, every single federal building going through the major renovation, all new buildings, they have to be designed to maximum 70 degree supply uh, temperature, water. So slowly we'll get there, but right now it was just impossible to do it in 80 some buildings in one shot. It was, the cost was just prohibitive. The old buildings. Uh, old building, massive masonry construction, most of them, very little insulation, and to, to switch to 70 degree water supply was just impossible. Yeah, so uh, in fact, the dog does wag the tail. Yes, right? It, yeah. uh, you know, you've you got to start with the customer and, and also work back. It, it's not uh, one size fits all for, for certain. Well, I want to thank our panelists uh, for being available. I want to congratulate you all again uh, for your achievement. Uh, I, having grown up in this industry, having been responsible for business development in a number of cities in my career, I know how hard it is to do what you just did. And so, uh, you know, congratulations uh, and on your heart, you know, on the completion of all your hard work. Uh, it, it doesn't just happen uh, without a lot of hard work uh, by all of you. I want to uh, thank our sustaining sponsors for their ongoing support of IDEA, Clearway Energy, NG, Johnson Controls, Solar Turbines, Thermo Systems, and Train. You know, I want to thank those uh, great organizations. And finally, I want to thank all of our, uh, our guests for attending. Uh, please visit uh, di our website, districtenergy.org. Uh, the report is here. Um, you'll get the link to it. I would urge you to share it among your colleagues, you know, so, you know, the people in your organizations who may not be aware that they're part of something so much bigger, um, you know, globally and nationally, you know, that, that I think that's a good place to start. Certainly, 
you know, uh, put it on your website, share it with your customers, your community, uh, uh, you know, the city council, the mayor's office, they should know uh, the good work that you're doing. And that, you know, there, there, there's advantage to having a thriving district energy in your city, in your community, on your campus. Uh, and so sometimes you got to squeak a, a bit, uh, you know, as a wheel. And I also want to remind you that all of the reports from prior years are available as well. So you can download and look at, you know, the, the, the growth and the success in our space going back literally 20 years. Um, and it, it does identify in many cases, the name of the building, the city where it's located, the size, uh, you know, it's really intended to be a resource for our members. So I, I hope you'll uh, take, uh, make use of it. And if we can help, uh, at, you know, at IDA, if we can help you with that, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, we're, we're here, uh, we're really here to be of service and help grow the industry. So finally, I want to thank um, uh, and congratulate our, uh, our winners for this year. Uh, I mentioned at the start, but we'll, we'll be doing this uh, as well for our members uh, outside of North America. Uh, it's going to mean that I'll be doing this at like five in the morning which I'm not at my best, uh, but with sufficient caffeine, perhaps, uh, you know, we'll uh, be able to achieve that. So uh, to our friends at Clearway, vicinity, Boston and, and Philadelphia, uh, and uh, then uh, our friends to the North in, in Ottawa, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations and uh, 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 we'll, uh, uh, we'll be seeing you soon. All right. Thank you thank all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Signing off now. Great job. Thank you.